turn to page. Okay, be honest. How many of you were hoping to receive your Hogwarts letter from a friendly white owl at some point in your life? Yours? They'll be writing to you. I know I was. We all love Harry Potter, like, a lot. But even if you watch all eight Harry Potter movies daily, to which I say you must have a time turner, three times should do anything. The question is, did you catch all these amazing hidden details? Take a look at some of the cleverest secrets you might have missed while watching your favorite Wizarding World franchise. You won't regret it. Let's get started. Oh, and Harry, don't forget, when you're done, just give it a tap and say, Mischief Managed. We all know that Harry and his father were both great seekers, but did you know a certain transfiguration professor also kicked butt on the Quidditch field? That's right, in the scene in the first movie where Harry looks at the special seeker badge engraved with his father's name, behind it is another badge with M. G. McGonagall, 1971, written on it. Suddenly, it makes way more sense why McGonagall was so adamant about bringing Harry to Oliver Wood as a potential new seeker instead of, you know, punishing an 11-year-old for flying crazy crazy without permission. And of course, this doesn't make sense when in Crimes of Grindelwald we see McGonagall as a professor in like 1927, but it's Crimes of Grindelwald. Nothing makes sense in that movie. A classic moment in the Sorcerer's Stone is when Neville first gets his remember -all. It turns red when it arrives, and Neville says he can't remember what he's forgotten, but eagle-eyed viewers can figure it out. In a really clever attention to detail, Neville is one of the few students in the banquet hall not wearing his long black robes. It shows that the production design team and the director went above and beyond with actually having something that Neville forgot that the audience could figure out if they looked around hard enough. I knew I loved these early movies for a reason. In the Chamber of Secrets, after Harry frees Dobby with a secret sock, Lucius Malfoy was a little upset. Well, more than a little upset. He pulled his wand and started saying Avada at Harry before Dobby stepped in. Now, imagine if you just watched these movies without reading the books. Hey, I'm sure there are some people like that. You would think that's a normal spell and only later learn that Avada Kedavra is the killing curse. Think about how crazy that is. Lucius was going to straight up eliminate Harry Potter right there in front of Dumbledore's office in the middle of Hogwarts. As dark as it sounds, I kind of would have wanted to see how this played out if Lucius succeeded here. We all know that Gilderoy Lockhart is a bit of a scumbag, but at least he has perfect hair, right? Well, actually, maybe not. In the Chamber of Secrets, when Ron and Harry go to Gilderoy's office to ask him for help, they find the five-time winner of Witch Weekly's Most Charming Smile Award attempting to flee. But also, did you see his desk in that scene? Sitting right there amongst the luggage and papers is a wig with Gilderoy's hairstyle just sitting there. This implies that those perfectly quaffed locks aren't the real thing, and now all I can do is picture a balding Gilderoy Lockhart. How hilarious. The Prisoner of Azkaban was the first movie to show that people didn't necessarily need wands to do magic, as evidenced by the quick flash of a leaky cauldron patron stirring his drink magically with his finger. That's what draws the most attention, but a fun detail is that the book he's reading is actually Stephen Hawking's famous A Brief History of Time book. I wonder what Stephen Hawking would think if he found out magic existed in his world. Also, this is a fun bit of foreshadowing as things get a bit timey-wimey later in the movie. A fun easter egg happens in Prisoner of Azkaban when Fred and George give Harry the Marauder's map. In a quick glimpse, you can just barely make out that one of the names walking around Hogwarts on the map is Newt's commander. Now, obviously this was just a fun reference at the time, but now that Newt is the main character in his own franchise, could this be retconned in a unique way? I'm just saying, if the Fantastic Beasts movie could find a way to have Newt time travel to Hogwarts in Harry's third year and that's why he's on the map, I'd forgive a lot of the problems with the new franchise. The Bow Battens are intoxicating beauties who tend to hypnotize a lot of young, pubescent boys as they glide gracefully through the hallways. They can make anything look elegant, even the Macarena. That's right, as the group cheers on Fleur as she participates in the Triwizard Tournament, the Bow Battens are just doing the Macarena. Like, is that their official school dance? Was it just a one-time fun thing? I have so many questions. In the books, we first learn about the Deathly Hallows in the last novel of the series, but the movies actually may have introduced the concept of the Deathly Hallows much earlier. In the Goblet of Fire movie, Dumbledore is in his office and he glances over at his cabinet. It's a little dark, but many fans absolutely swear that you can see a Deathly Hallows symbol sitting there. The urban legend goes that J.K. Rowling asked the production team to put that there as a bit of foreshadowing to what comes later, and if 
if that's true, well, mission accomplished. The Basilisk in Chamber of Secrets was a pretty large puppet brought to life by some good old-fashioned movie magic. But after the movie, what do you do with a prop that big? You can't just toss it in the dumpster out back. Luckily, the creative team behind the movies found a way to reuse the Basilisk puppet by refashioning it into the dragon model we see in Goblet of Fire. Now, my question is, whose job was it to house the giant puppet in between movies? Do you think it was some poor PA named Kyle who had to find space for it in his garage with the instruction to not throw it away? The Quidditch World Cup is an incredibly popular event filled with witches, wizards, and other creatures from around the world. Yes, the book was a bit better in showing the scope of everything, but the Goblet of Fire film was fun too. And in a blink and you'll miss it moment, you'll see two house elves ride by, with one of them looking exactly like Dobby. Could it be some other random elf? Sure, but I like to think Dobby, who was free at this point, spent a lot of time vacationing and having fun, and the Quidditch World Cup is the perfect place for that. What do witches and wizards eat for breakfast? Why, cheery owls and pixie puffs, of course. They're gobbling great. The special cereals have popped up in the Harry Potter films, mainly probably as a way to avoid having to pay for branded cereals like Cheerios. But that does beg the question, who's making wizard cereal? Is it done in a factory the same way muggle cereal is made? Is the taste any different? If I don't eat the pixie puffs in a certain time, will they turn into real pixies and attack me? You know what? I'll just stick with eggs and bacon. The Harry Potter movies always did a great job with generally keeping the same plot and characters from the books, so it was weird when new characters who weren't in the source material were added. This happened in Order of the Phoenix with the young Nigel. Sure, Nigel doesn't have a huge impact in the story and it's not like it's a big deal, but it's still strange to see a character that book fans aren't familiar with. Now, if Nigel turned out to be Nagini in disguise, that would have been a fun twist. Almost everyone knew that Ron and Hermione were endgame for each other, mostly after Goblet of Fire, but it was fun to see them dance around their feelings for so long before finally acting on it. And there were fun small details that hinted at their future relationship throughout the series. One of these instances happened with the Patronuses. Ron's Patronus was a Jack Russell Terrier and Hermione's was an Otter. Well, in real life, Jack Russell Terriers are used to hunt a variety of different animals, including Otters. Uh-oh, does this mean that Ron and Hermione aren't destined to have a happy marriage? Eh, they're probably fine. The number 7 has always been a huge detail in the Harry Potter franchise, but one time it was used to reference the most famous soccer player in the world. In The Half-Blood Prince, Harry wears the number 7 on his Quidditch uniform, and as the costume designer once explained, this was in reference to David Beckham, who also wore that number while he played for Manchester United. You know what? I bet in that world, David Beckham was secretly a wizard. I mean, it's the only way his insane skills make sense. When making the love potion in Half-Blood Prince, it's revealed to have really appealing smells to whoever is around it. For Hermione, this includes standard Hermione things like fresh parchment paper, but the last thing she mentions is spearmint toothpaste. Now, this could be in reference to her dentist's parents, but also there's a popular theory that's been fueled by J.K. Rowling that she actually smells Ron's hair and just doesn't want to admit it to the class. And Emma Watson's reaction here actually makes that theory pretty plausible, don't you think? Now, I wonder what Ron's hair smells like. Probably not like fresh parchment. This one's a fun detail. In the final movie during the 19 years later epilogue, we see Harry with his son, Albus Severus Potter, and he's played by Arthur Bowen. But this actually wasn't the first time Bowen appeared in the series. The actor actually has a small cameo as an extra in Half-Blood Prince, where he can be seen getting roasted chestnuts in Diagon Alley. It shows that a lot of actors work their way up, so be sure to keep an eye out for every extra you see in a movie from now on. You never know who's going to be a star. During the filming of Half-Blood Prince and Deathly Hallows Part 1, Daniel Radcliffe stretched himself a bit by pursuing a bit of theater. He starred in the play Equus, and it was incredibly controversial because it involved Daniel Radcliffe going fully nude. And Deathly Hallows Part 1 has a reference to this. In the coffee shop that Harry, Ron, and Hermione retreat to, in the background, you can make out a poster for Equus. I wonder if any wizards saw that poster and thought the main guy looked incredibly like the boy who lived. It's not a big secret that the Harry Potter movies got a lot darker as time went on, like not only in tone, but also in general color. The whimsical, brightly colored aspects of the first two movies were slowly replaced with more gray and blacks as time went on. But there was another thing outside the movie that also changed, the opening Warner Bros. logo. Every movie sees the Warner Bros. logo that plays at the beginning slowly get darker and darker, signifying that things are getting a lot worse in the wizarding world. 
Although we all kind of knew that Snape wasn't that bad of a guy, it was always a little hard to trust him given his actions, like when he straight up killed Dumbledore and helped take over the school. Of course, we know now he was playing the long game, and it was interesting to see how he kept up his evil charade while also secretly being a good guy. The best example of this is in Deathly Hallows Part 2, where he gets in a duel with McGonagall. When McGonagall shoots an attack at Snape, Snape seems overwhelmed. But look closely and notice how he diverts the spell to hit the two Karos standing behind him before fleeing. It's just an awesome moment. As Harry and his friends run to get to Snape in the epic final battle of Hogwarts, a fun aspect is that during their sprint, they encounter elements from almost every past movie in their way. They're attacked by a troll, run away from spiders, see a werewolf, and battle Dementors before getting to Snape. It's a great way to revisit the past in truly epic fashion. I already mentioned that Newt Scamander revealed during the Prisoner of Azkaban, but that's not the only fun detail the map reveals. During the end credits of the movie, there's a rather infamous dirty joke, and I'm sure you all caught it and know about it, right? 